We're kicking off the Child Hunger Summit today at Chobani with some passionate advocates and problem solvers. Hamdi Ulukaya is, of course, Chobani's founder. And in addition to making better food for more people, Chobani and Hamdi are out there in the communities every day helping. They're also pushing and educating lawmakers to make real change, like ending school lunch shaming. Now, Hamdi knows the other two panelists and their organizations quite well, both Feeding America and the Food Research and Action Center, or FRAC. Hamdi recently penned an op-ed with Feeding America, which is the country's leading network of 200 food banks. And together, they called on Congress to bolster funding for critical programs in the middle of the pandemic. Katie Fitzgerald, Feeding America's COO, is here with us today. And so is FRAC President Luis Guardia. FRAC is the country's leading anti-hunger advocacy and policy research group. And I'm very proud of the fact that FRAC Feeding America and Chobani have worked together to call for a bold and ambitious child nutrition reauthorization to support millions of families and children. Hamdi, first over to you. Solving child hunger is deeply woven into Chobani's values and its mission. Why is solving this issue so important to you? And what is Chobani doing that's different than other food companies? Thank you, Christina. I, I am honored to be here with you and Luis and, and Katie, of course, and the organization they, uh, they represent. Um, and, you know, being in so many Zoom calls, you know, during this pandemic time, uh, I think this is one of the, the most meaningful uh, Zoom call or remote gathering that we could do. Um, and I am, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that we're doing this. I'm really happy that we're bringing this conversation up to surface. I've always said, this pandemic is an opportunity. Not, you know, as much as it's 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 a crisis that we're going through, as much as it's it's horrible that how society, humanity, every individual is is going through this pandemic. But it is what it is. Um, how we come out of it, and what are the learnings, and what kind of opportunities out there that we can make life better uh, for 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 most of the people out there. Um, this child hunger, um, hunger, of course. But then within that child hunger that we're talking about is something that every single one of us can agree that is not acceptable. And if anybody has a problem with that, then we can shame that instead of shaming you know, children uh, in, the, in the lunchroom uh, because their parent hasn't paid their bills or they couldn't. Um, it is hard to believe that in this country, which is the wealthiest country or the biggest economy in the world, is the most advanced or most influential or, you, you know, the innovative. It, the, 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 the line goes on and on. Think that in this country, there are children, there are millions of children, they're going to bed hungry or they don't get enough nutrition. Or there are families having a hard conversation with their children with their family members and saying why they don't have something in their table to eat or feed their families. It's shameful, it's extremely shameful. But where we start is we need to understand and we need to accept that this is a reality. This is happening. And if we don't, then we can't solve it. We can't go anywhere from it. And you know, you mentioned uh, the children and, and the schools. Um, and what we do for the lawmakers with other organizations like Feeding America and FRAC. When we said, okay, we'll pay this lunch shaming money for the school in Rhode Island or in, in Twin Falls, but that's not gonna solve the problem. The, the, the topic is here to bring the awareness to people to, to understand this exists. And it, to our surprises, a lot of lawmakers didn't even know this was, this was out there and they were hurt. You know, they were bothered by it. And, and rightfully so, they should be, and every one of us should be bothered by it. It is, uh, I think it's number one priority is this topic also arise during the pandemic because hunger became a topic during the pandemic and people saw those lines uh, in front of food banks and they were not the people that they expect to see. I don't know what are the stereotype of people they expect to see on those lines, but they were people in their cars and waiting hours uh, and in every communities, in, instead of some communities that we used, we used to think that would happen only those places. So hunger became a topic. And within that, 
um, we understood that a lot of children, millions of children, the only time they have an access to food is when they were actually in the school. And when the school closed, those millions of children, one meal a day that they had an access to went away. And that became more, you know, alerting, more, uh, you know, uh, than, than pandemic itself, really, because you're talking about essential, you know, eating. Um, so this topic is arised into a certain level. I think it should be even further up, but it's more in the awareness of more and more people's uh, reception. It is perfect time, perfect time, not only this conference, but for not only for FARC and Feeding America, but all of us to get together. And uh, yeah. every angle of the communities and societies and lawmakers uh, come together and solve this once at all. So in this country, we don't talk about children going to bed hungry. Right now, there is such a conversation, Katie, about reopening schools and how to do that safely and make sure that students and teachers you know, don't spread COVID, don't get sick. But lost in that conversation is a topic on feeding children and the children that are going back to school and whether or not we're going to continue to provide, you know, lunches for them and meals for them in the way that we're doing now, which covers everyone. You know, how do you keep this conversation in the forefront when policymakers and teachers and uh, principals are just worried about basic safety of not spreading COVID? How do you keep nutrition and child hunger at the center of those conversations? Well, you know, it's a, it's a terrific question, but I think Hamdi, you're absolutely right. What we have witnessed and what we believe is happening is what you described, which is that prior to the pandemic, unfortunately, there were too many conversations with too many people where we had to sort of convince people that food insecurity was a real issue in this country where food is so ubiquitous and people could sort of believe that it wasn't the case that kids would go to bed hungry or that kids were reliant, as you described, on meals, breakfast and lunch in the classroom and the after school program and the summer feeding programs that we do. So one silver lining, though I'm with you, it's hard to say there are any, but one silver lining is that there is awareness, there is empathy, and there is public will now at a level that we frankly have never seen before. Um, and we're seeing that demonstrated in the level of activity on the ground in terms of distribution of food. We're seeing it in the level of, of advocacy uh, from the communities that we work with. We have 200 food banks and they are highly mobilized in their communities around federal nutrition policy and state level policy. We've seen it with governors bringing National Guard to the solution, other nonprofits approaching us, and countless numbers of companies led by companies like Chobani and Hamdi, who have been leaders out there saying, we want to be a part of the solution. We want to donate our warehouse space. We want to donate our resources. We want to, we want to turn, we've had manufacturers turn whole lines of manufacturing over to produce meals for kids who are in need. So I think we are in a moment of tremendous public will and that we need to keep the conversation going to your point, Christina. And we do that by making sure that we tell stories of what people are experiencing and make sure that people don't um, fall into that habit of looking away uh, when the economy starts, we hope to go into recovery. Because what we do know is that the Great Recession, it took about 10 years to get food insecurity levels back to pre-recession levels. And we really don't, we're not gonna wait 10 years this time. We need to get there much faster. Katie, you talked about that there's never been a better time now because of the public sentiment that's built up and the public awareness around this issue. Luis, to you, what can the Biden-Harris administration really do at this juncture to secure better access to food for our children? Well, uh, thanks, Christina, for the question. And, and there, there are uh, several things uh, that I would say both the administration and Congress can do to fight this problem. Uh, we need all parts of government working together 
to, uh, to, ad to address this issue. And uh, there are several, and I'll just mention uh, a couple, uh, 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 for example. But I think when, when we've been, uh, at least at FRAC, when we think about this overall, it really kind of come down, it comes down to access. We want to make sure that children have access to the nutrition they need to have, um, uh, have the, uh, to, to reach their, their full opportunity and to lead uh, healthier, uh, better lives and, uh, and improve the lives of, of those around them in the community. So we have uh, a fairly uh, uh, bold, ambitious uh, notion of seeing free meals for all school children. This is uh, a really, really important uh, juncture that we're at, as, as has been mentioned. Uh, we, uh, we've seen uh, the harm and uh, that, that comes from uh, programs uh, getting eaten away or you know not making uh, the efforts uh, not making the advances that, that we need to make we need to think of of, of the of these kind of bold solutions at this moment um, and uh, as Kay said because we don't we don't want to keep doing this on and on uh, for 10 years so on the administrative side uh, during covid uh, we saw some really uh, great things happen even though as as we said, uh, it's odd to say that because uh, amidst a, a, a tr tremendous amount of suffering, we did see some things happen. I would say that the first thing uh, that, uh, uh, that, that we saw was uh, the addition of some flexibilities that were brought on by, by USDA. Flexibility, you know, the, the school meals programs are great programs, but they have a lot of protocols that, that they need to follow. And when COVID hit, a lot of those things were kind of thrown into disarray because kids weren't able to access their meals at their local schools anymore. So, the, so we saw communities, we saw um, uh, the charitable sector, parents groups, schools, all kind of working together on how to make things work, how to get grab and go meals set up. So, uh, uh, because the, these programs uh, are, are funded uh, through the uh, through the federal school meal program, uh, USDA uh, pivoted. Uh, well, uh, to uh, to eliminate some of those barriers and issued some some of these flexibilities. Now, uh, these flexibilities, a lot of them are going to end in June, and we need to see them continue because even though, as I said, we don't want to wait forever, but we still know we still know we have a ways to go. Uh, the reopening of schools uh, across the country it certainly hasn't been uh, a, a uniform or or complete. So we need to make sure that these uh, continue uh, at least uh, through the end, uh, end of next year, and uh, we need to make sure that a lot of the uh, benefits uh, th that we see are uh, per, uh, a lot of the benefits that we saw and learnings that that were uh, experienced during COVID can be uh, continued and enshrined into into policies to make sure that government continues to be flexible and adaptable. Uh, for example, one of the uh, the other great things we saw during uh, uh, during COVID, in terms of and uh, again in terms of a response, was the creation of a great program called the Pandemic EBT program, where par uh, where uh, families of children who are participating in these meal programs received a card, and that card allowed them to uh, purchase food that was the equivalent of what they otherwise would would have gotten from school. So, uh, continuing these uh, these programs. Is essential and on the congressional side uh, th things like continuing these flexibilities continuing to support programs like pandemic EBT looking forward to uh, a vision where we can have all children have access to free school meals we have a great opportunity coming up in a piece of legislation called the child nutrition reauthorization that we expect to be coming up and uh, we really need our, our policymakers uh, to be uh, to be receptive to these and and think long term about about these solutions. Now, as part of that, Luis, right now in the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Act, there is not a discussion about the first point that you brought up, which is universal free meals or universal school lunches. Hamdi, I know that this is something that you're super passionate about. We haven't heard too much from the business community on this, but do you support free lunches for all students? 
no matter what they're... Like Luis said, this this is no brainer, right? This is this is really really no brainer. I think um, I think this this idea is supported by mayors, supported by teachers, supported by educators, pediatricians. Anyone you can think of, they support this idea. One is every child in the classroom or in the school having access to the same food, uh, so the le level is is the same. Uh, no one is shamed. No one is looked. Who's you know? What's your income? What's your background? What's your kind of family you live? Uh, there is a food, and everybody is sitting around the chair, around the table, sharing this food. Um, I will go one one step further than that. I say, okay, free universal. Um, you know, meal or whatever you call it um, for all children in schools, but a quality one, a good one, not a, you know, shitty food. You know, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but we have to get angry on, on food that is, you know, is given to the children in the schools. You know, it, sometimes you say this is maybe better not to serve. It's, it's pretty shameful. Now, everyone in America should know <laughs> that this is not just happening in the U.S. People serve their children meal almost everywhere around the world, around the world in, the, in the schools. You know, you go to Europe, I mean, you don't have to go far away. You can go to Turkey, that happens in Turkey too. You go to France, you go to the cafeteria of Germany, the, the kids are getting these meals into their tables. It's beautiful. It's presented beautiful. It's, it's delicious, it's nutritious, it's natural, it's good. And it's not surprising, it's just what it should be. If you're not going to give best of yours to your children for your next generation, then who are you going to give it to? If you're not going to invest in their health, in their brain, in their, you know, uh, uh, in their well-being, then what else are you going to invest in? Why are you going to invest in the road if you're not going to invest in your children? And the best investment comes the nutrition, the food, for emotional reason and for you know, health reason. All that reasons, those children need to be, uh, be fed. So yes, like, I agree with Luis, this is one idea we can all gather around. I think there's willingness around this. I think there won't be too many pushback. As I said, if there is a pushback, I think there should be massive shaming should we go around on this. But at least on this topic, we can all get together. I mean, when, when we called to some of the lawmakers uh, in both aisles uh, about this topic, I remember on the phone, this was a very beautiful, pleasant conversation. Um, and. And I don't think anyone will be against it. There might be some nuance around it, but yes, to, to answer that question, uh, a universal school meals for every children to have an access to, and, and this meal to be designed to be beautiful and nutritious. And I'm, I'm not saying fancy, I'm saying at least, at least good for them, for their well-being. And I think this is also good um, um, when it comes to national security. You know, you look at the child obesity, you know, we're talking about hunger, but it's all at the same time not eating better, uh, especially this is happening in the school environment. The, the, the obesity, the uh, diabetes among children is off the chart. It's off the chart. And, and in a healthy body, there's going to be healthy mind. And there's one more nuance. If children are eating better, healthier, they are the best influencers to their families to eat better and eat healthier. You know, it's, it study says that fathers or parents or the families, they change habit if the pressure comes from their children. And today's children <laughs> can pressure their parents to do things better. You know, quit smoking, eat better. Um, I think there's so many reasons to do that. This pandemic shows showed us that, uh, you know, preconditions we have, uh, is really, uh, you know, it, 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 that's, that's a big effect of what this COVID does to you. If, if you're healthier, if, you're, if you don't have a heart problem, if you don't have a diabetes, if you don't have all this um, uh, nutrition-based, really mostly, or activity-based conditions, you know, chances of you passing through is a lot easier if, if you don't. So being healthy is also affected by what you eat and is massively affected by the eat. So for so many reasons, this should be no brainer. Luis, can you explain a little bit about how free lunches for everyone, universal school lunches differs from the system that's in place today for people who may not be in the weeds of it like we are? 
Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, it's uh, uh, we, we've seen some progress towards this um, already. So, on um, uh, there are uh, there are programs within USDA uh, called things like community eligibility, where we see uh, areas that uh, are particularly hard hit, uh, where some of these uh, schools in, in these areas have access uh, to, to free school meals. And then uh, we've seen some, uh, as I mentioned, some of the uh, um, some of the flexibilities granted expand that during uh, during COVID. Uh, but we believe that there is uh, uh, not only, a, 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 as, a, as Hamdi was saying, in terms of uh, this issue of having uh, uh, equity among all kids, having all kids that have access uh, to free meals, but also quality meals. We also believe. That, uh, that 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 uh, uh, we've uh, when from, from people we talk to, we know that there can be uh, uh, other great benefits. Uh, Hamdi mentioned also uh, uh, the the issue of, of school lunch shaming and and, and the collection of, of school debt. Uh, you know, I, I I think I think it's probably safe to say that uh, people who aspire and who want to go into education don't wake up every morning saying, "Gee, I want to go chase down some school lunch debt today." No, they want to make sure they're providing good meals for their kids. They want to provide, ensure they're providing the, the best education. And so we know that uh, that there could be a tremendous amount of, um, of refocusing of, of effort, uh, and there can be uh, much greater uh, efficiencies uh, that can be achieved by uh, by by looking at a program like uh, like Universal Preschool. So it's 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 something that uh, that that we're really excited about. And and, and as we mentioned, I think uh, we have. Uh, you know, we, we've seen uh, the, the benefit of, uh, of, uh, of what happens when kids have better access to quality school meals, and we, and, and, and we see also um, uh, the, the peril uh, that, that happens when, when they don't. Uh, you know, uh, I'll just mention uh, in closing, we, we also kind of have to be intellectually honest, and I think uh, uh, Katie uh, mentioned this a little bit, uh, before COVID, we had a hunger crisis, and she mentioned about how it was hard to get people to focus on it. One in seven children were hungry before COVID. Now it's been, and since COVID, it's been one in four. One in four. Uh, so, uh, and and we know also about how some of these uh, disparities break down um, uh, uh, between um, racial groups as well. We know that black and brown households uh, uh, and households. Uh, of, uh, with the mixed immigrant status, they, they tend to have uh, a greater incidence of food insecurity. So strengthening these programs, providing programs like we're saying, like Universal Meals, really can do a lot to advance a lot of the other issues that we've all seen uh, addressed and brought up in, in, in many ways over the past year, uh, kind of been related to and in conjunction with the COVID pandemic. Yeah, Luis, to your point, um, I, I, now is definitely the, the time when Congress should act on this. And even if we don't get the universal school lunch policy or school meal policy that you and Hamdi are so uh, passionate about advocating, there hopefully will be a child nutrition reauthorization this year. Right, Katie? How, how likely do you think it is that we at least get that. And what should Congress include to make sure that children have the right access they need? Well, I think we need to, as we talked earlier, push as hard as we can for uh, programs that really make sense for children in schools, to Luis's point. I mean, I, I think the opportunity for reauthorization is just like it has not been before. Isn't and so we have every reason to believe that that uh, reauthorization conversation can move forward. And I think we all have to do what you're doing today, which is lock arms together and talk to our uh, congressional leaders and uh, the administration and make sure that they understand how critically important this is for children and families to reauthorize the Child Nutrition Act. I would say that, you know, having been in the field myself even, watching some of the bureaucracy and the administrative work that goes on managing all these different kinds of programs to Luis's point, the more we can learn from this pandemic and how 
the loosening of some of these regulations, the flexibilities that have been put into place have made food so much more available um, in this really difficult time when it was needed and that there's no reason to go back to an overly regulated, um, highly sort of bureaucratic system that um, costs a lot of money to administer, uh, having, having worked at food bank that did those kinds of programs um, and really doesn't do all it can to make sure every child has access to those meals. So there's a great opportunity before us to do it. The other thing I would just add, because I think in my mind and in our work, we can never talk about federal nutrition programs for children without also talking about the supplemental nutrition assistance program. The gains that we have made during the pandemic all collectively to get increased benefits in that program and the executive order that the Biden-Harris administration has put forward to look at the thrifty food plan, which sets the foundational sort of um, levels of benefits, is really critical that we keep both those things going and that we sustain the increase in benefits for families in the SNAP program because they have been too low for too long. And it is uh, one of the single greatest ways that in addition to meals in schools that we can make sure children are getting fed in their homes with their families, able to pick the food uh, in a retail setting that they need and they want and that will bring them nourishment um, and to Hamdi's point, really delight in being able to eat um, food and get up and work and learn the next day. Yeah, I know that's something that Hamdi has specifically called on Congress uh, to do both in SNAP pandemic EBT. Uh, we talked a lot, Katie, about what Congress can do. Even we talked to Luis about what the Biden-Harris administration could do. But what are some of the tangible actions that every single person who's watching right now, what are some of the actions they can take? Yeah, so obviously this is a question we all get all the time. And my answer is always, there's no action too small that you can take. So in your community, you can start by picking up local organizations that distribute meals or pack and sort meals. And, some, and right now, not many folks go out and volunteer because of the pandemic, and that's understandable. So you can get on social media and share articles and information and share this, this Child Hunger Summit, help educate people that food insecurity in America is real, and there is something we can do about it. You can join a local neighborhood group that's doing a food closet in their community or join, again, a, a local organization and donate food directly. Get involved with your local food bank. Go look up a FRAC and learn about uh, the data and the policy and either through food banks or the uh, Food and Research uh, Action Council, get involved in advocating with your local con Congress leaders um, and state representatives as well, because the states really do play an important role in the administration of food, uh, food programs. And so, um, you know, writing, calling, emailing, uh, those are the things that every single one of us uh, can do and uh, should do to really make a difference for ch children and families right now. And also, Luis, just queuing off of what everyday people can do, can you talk about what resources struggling families might want to tap into to help feed their children during this time? What is out there that maybe isn't as obvious as you would think? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Katie uh, uh, mentioned one of them, certainly uh, SNAP program, that's the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, it is the, the country's first line of defense uh, against hunger, and uh, and 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 as uh, and as we discussed, uh, there uh, there have been uh, some improvements uh, to that uh, through, uh, with uh, the Biden Harris uh, administration um, executive orders, and we are uh, hopeful that we, we can get some of those codified uh, longer term uh, through um, uh, through uh, the uh, the America Rescue. Uh, uh, legislation that's that's working its way through Congress, uh, but uh, when when people uh, are are uh, need to access these programs, uh, there are a, a tremendous amount of resources that are available to them, and and we really hope uh, people can take advantage of them. Um, uh, uh, Katie's absolutely right. Uh, uh, when we when we think about this, uh, and of course us, you know, uh, uh, us in the kind of policy realm. 
we're thinking about it both at the state level and we also think about it at the federal level. And, and, there, um, and at the state level, uh, state uh, departments uh, of health and, and human services uh, have uh, uh, usually have access on, on, their, on their websites and phone numbers where people can call uh, to get enrolled in these programs. Uh, also, if people visit frac.org, we have uh, a listing of all the various um, uh, state partners that we work with. Uh, uh, a lot of them are also part of the, uh, of the Feeding America Network, and they also uh, provide some assistance uh, to get people onto these programs in, in terms of uh, application assistance, or if it's just helping them get oriented or understand what, what the basic requirements are. And, you know, uh, a lot of people, uh, as, as we were talking about at the very beginning, reminded me of a story that at the very beginning of, of, of COVID, we had um, our Maryland group was inundated uh, with, with phone calls. And among them was, was a couple who, uh, who they didn't know how they were going to put food on the table. Uh, we connected them uh, to, uh, to, the, to the SNAP offices in, in the state. And uh, it was not it was not an, it was not an issue. I'm sorry, it was not an option that they had even thought of. Uh, they, uh, they lived in a rural part of, of the state. Uh, access uh, to to, uh, to other places was was difficult, and so SNAP ended up being um, a good solution for them. So uh, I would say uh, uh, visit uh, frac.org, uh, get connected with, with the local um, uh, with, the, with, the, with the local uh, organizations. Uh, that can help out, and also uh, uh, folks in the Feeding America Network also have have some of these um, have some of these uh, capabilities as well. And uh, it is uh, you know it, it's a program that that's there, and we're gonna. But we also need to work uh, at making it making it stronger because we know that if we if we put everything we have into this, if we take advantage of this moment, we can move towards like I was I was mentioning greater racial equity for future generations by ensuring that uh, families and children, that they all have access to the nutrition that they need really to fuel their dreams. And that's what it's about. So uh, we're hoping people can take advantage of that. Uh, Luis, I'm so glad that you brought up, you know, now twice the racial inequities and how that plays into this, uh, the, the, the topic of child hunger. We do have a panel for anybody who's listening to this one specifically dedicated to that issue. And uh, you can't really separate the two here when, when you talk about child hunger um, because it does have a disproportionate uh, impact on black and brown Americans. Hamdi, I'm gonna close this out uh, with you because some people who are tuning in might not really fully comprehend why Chobani is putting on a child hunger summit. And I wanna put the spotlight on you for a second because your personal story is so important to why we are here today, not long after you immigrated to the US, you started taking college courses in English and business. And then when you started Chobani, you made nutrition and affordability a priority from day one. Take viewers through why you did that. Sure. Um, you know, growing up, I loved yogurt. Um, you know, I grew up with shepherds and um, I don't remember a day or, or a time where there was not this beautiful cup of yogurt were in our table. Or if you are out with the shepherds, they would give you a cup of yogurt with a loaf of bread. Um, and later on, you know, when you go to big cities, you, it didn't matter if you were rich or poor or you lived in a suburb or a city or town or whatever, you always had to have yogurt. That's what the Turks are. You know, they have to have that yogurt. And they are particular about their yogurt. It's just, it has to be simple and not too much stuff is added. And it's not too much to ask. It's the most accessible thing in the whole universe to have. Uh, so yogurts and honey and pomegranate and olive and, you know, a, a good loaf of bread. This is not a class things. These are just simple things that you have an access to. Um, when I arrived here, it, I, it just hit me in the head that if you were in a big city, it's more, you know, big city. And if you have, you know, some, you know, good income, you could go to uh, some specialty stores and get a, a good cup of yogurt. But if you live in Norwich uh, and, and the options were pretty lousy and, and, and I, just, I just couldn't believe in that. And that's just 
Um, I, that's just going back to my childhood memories. And, and, and we talked about this here, why, why food is so important. Even today, when I, when I make products, I go back to my childhood memories. And when I have people working at Chobani, I ask them their childhood memories when it comes to taste, when it comes to food. Food is extremely essential in our life, not only for nutrition and you know, calories and, and proteins that we need, but also develop us going forward. We always go back to those food memories. And the food memories are stronger than our other memories. You remember more taste, more memories relate to taste and that action than anything else. And if they are pleasant, then you can always go back to those pleasant moments. If they are not so pleasant, then where do you go to? You go to cows, you go to worries. And millions of children today will go back eating those food, remembering that they were hungry, remembering that it was, their mother was worrying, remembering that it was tough, remembering that they were angry. Um, I think children should grow remembering that their grandmother's apple pie or a s'more around a, a campfire or a cup of yogurt that shepherd gives them and because those are healthy memories to develop. And for me, it's a human rights issue. It's, it's not just uh, a something that you're against, it's really a human rights issue when it comes to simple food, simple nutrition for everyone to have an access to. So I developed Chobani thinking that a food, uh, it, you know, better food for more people, food that everybody deserves to have. And I'm not talking about you know, fancy food that of course, you know, okay, so I get it. I'm so talking about, you know, staple food, simple foods, uh, that tomatoes shouldn't be, depends on your class or yogurt or honey or, you know, all that kind of stuff. So for me, um, if I can think of, if I want to be, to be remembered for one thing and one thing only is democratization of food, and, 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 and putting enormous amount of focus on children to have an access to and delicious, nutritious foods that they're growing up, their memories are pleasant, not, um, not, not, uh, not negative. Hamdi, thank you. Thank you for that fantastic story. And if you thank didn't know you. it, you, you know it now. And I, I, and, and I, I want to add one more thing. And I think yeah. on, this, on this effort, of course, FRAC and Feeding America during this pandemic, um, you know, they just became rock stars. And you go to communities uh, and you ask, uh, Katie, what every one of us can do. I get inspired by, you know, just, just down the block where there's a kitchen feeding the homelesses every single day and their volunteers that they show up every single time. To, to feed these people food every single day. And, and then you look at chefs you know, around the cities and around the countries when their restaurants close, how they turn their kitchens to provide food to people in need. Uh, and you look at you know, volunteers from all sorts of lives, right? They're getting off their homes and taking their mask on and going to the communities and cooking, delivering, uh, educating, healthy eating with, uh, with children. Uh, and putting themselves out there to move the community forward, move the society forward, but contributing and, 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 and providing. So I think there's an enormous amount of good deeds and heroes out there in real life. Um, combination of all that energy, combination of that billing coming into a surface and saying, it is time in this country, at least in this country, we can all come together and make an end to this basic human rights, um, which is access into good food. And within that, we should all have a right to get angry if one child in, does, in this country uh, go to bed hungry because this beautiful country couldn't provide food for that child children to eat. Um, I think that is a noble thing to be uh, involved. And I, I think because of this pandemic, just like Lewis and Katie said, because of the pandemic, because of the awareness is where we are, because we know how it feels not to have, have access to food. Uh, we cannot waste this time. We cannot waste this opportunity to make a change that lasts forever. So um, I, I, think, I, think, I think there are a lot of heroes and there are a lot of effective people and leaders out there for us to put us together to make this work. So I'm honored to be with you all and we'll continue to fight.
Thank you all for a wonderful discussion, but thank you more for being out there every day and fighting to end child hunger. We're gonna take a quick 30 minute break, but make sure to tune back in because we have much more in store and we have many more calls to action.